So welcome everyone. Welcome to Retrofit Talks this Tuesday lunchtime. Um, it's our final webinar for the Retrofit 23 program here at the Building Centre. Um, as you know, we've been exploring residential retrofit and how to achieve deep retrofit of homes at scale. So thank you everyone for, for joining today. I'm Laura Broderick and I'm delighted that we have Suzanne Davenport from Studio Partenting presenting for us today. Suzanne is an associate for the design practice and she worked on the rollout of the energy sprung work in Nottingham. Suzanne will present for about 20 minutes um, before she's also joined by Richard Partington for the Q&A with you, our webinar audience. Richard is director of the studio and he led the pilot. So just a little bit by way of context, energy sprung was developed in the Netherlands. It's a whole house retrofit system where homes are fully insulated using off-site manufactured wall and roof panels in conjunction with pre-assembled energy pots. I'm really looking forward to hearing about more of how this model came to the UK. So thank you again for attending today and over to Suzanne for the presentation about the Energy Sprung pilot in Nottingham. Thank you all. Hello, hi there. Um, to share our presentation. Hello, hi. Um, so we're going to discuss a project today that Studio Partington have been working on in Nottingham since 2017, that as Laura introduced, applies the Dutch Energy Sprong retrofit principles. We're going to look at the pilot project, which was the first Energy Sprong project completed in the UK in 2018. And then the ongoing rollout project um, where 60 homes have been completed to date and what lessons um, we can learn from that. So energy sprung means um, energy leap and is an energy and importantly comfort standard. Um, there are two key things to understand, and that is that the retrofit is undertaken with the residents in situ, so people carry on living on, in their homes. Um, they sometimes have to move out for a few hours if craning over can't be avoided. And it is also an assured performance scheme. So the energy sprung provider, that's the contractor, signs a contract to meet the energy and comfort targets. The only way that this can be achieved is through monitoring after the project is complete. So this focuses the mind on the performance gap. So energy sprung is appropriate for large repeated home types, which is what we have here in Nottingham. So these are non-traditional construction, three-story split roof houses, um, bungalows and two-story flats. And there we, you find this typology across Nottingham in areas redeveloped after the war. Um, this approach is particularly appropriate when substantial maintenance or expenditure is required, um, is on the horizon for the homes. So you can see here that the both the timber and copper cladding is badly deteriorated. Um, and this is because the retrofit cost can be recovered through time using the comfort plan, which residents pay in lieu of gas bills um, and then can be reinvested by clients in future re retrofits to benefit more residents. Um, this is the completed pilot project. Um, it's a nice quote here from one of the residents. The homes have been entirely overclad um, with new timber frame facade panels, um, which sit on new foundations um, and new roofs entirely covered in PVs. On the left hand side of the image, you can see um, one of the challenges of this project and other energy from retrofits, which is the privately owned rights by homes that can't be retrofitted. And the, the first 10 home pilot had a full communal energy system. You can see the um, image there of the energy center, um, which sat at the end of the um, pilot terrace of houses, um, which had a um, battery, thermal stores, ground source heat pumps and distribution system. Um, so this was really helpful to offset the diversity within the terrace and um, balancing energy use and energy storage across a group of homes but um, it did prove costly and it's difficult to retrofit the um, energy center and distribution into an urban setting. So like lack of space, issues of crossing privately owned homes. And so the later phases, which you can see on the right of the slide have tested different um, ME approaches and have eventually moved towards individual self-contained systems. You can see the air source heat pumps there. Um, So 
Engagement with the residents is key to the approach and the retrofit is discussed in tangible terms of being more comfortable or if you've got residents in fuel poverty, being actually able to heat your home um, and paying the same or less as before the retrofit if you use the same amount. So the pilot, which is the, um, the pink window surrounds in the center, um, was was a really was a very successful project, um, but it was quite a costly way of retrofitting homes. Um, as it was the first of its kind in the UK, there was fixed price of sixty four thousand sixty five thousand pounds per home, and this relied on EU funding and UK grants to make the the business case for it. Um, it's important to recognise that this business case is based on whole life costings and not simply focused on capital costs. And then through prefabrication, smart technology and economies of scale, the aspiration is that energy sprung homes can be retrofitted at a cost approaching £40,000, um, which was the challenge we moved on to for the rollout project. Um, in the rollout, um, currently over 60 homes have been retrofitted in Nottingham. And then in the wider introduction of energy sprung into the UK, uh, it's now been applied to 173 properties across nine schemes in the UK, with significantly more to follow in 2022-2023. So, um, so those figures of the 173 homes, they come from um, the UK performance overview, which energy sprung published for in last year um, and the kind of headline outcomes from that you can see the details on the right of the slide but the head come outcomes is that retrofitted homes are using 70 percent less energy on average compared to typical uk dwellings um, and this is despite quite wide variation in consumption and some residents setting higher temperatures and consuming more electricity through plug sockets, um, but as we go forward, we can, looking at future projects, we're designing in that comfort taking, and even with the increased um, electricity consumption, which I think was around 30%, um, more that could be offset by just one kilowatt peak of additional PV, which I think is around three panels. Um, and then we have some data from Nottingham specifically. So this is from the Nottingham pilot on the right here. So technically minded amongst you can, can read those figures, but the overall thing to point out is the probably the um, average space heating consumption of 58 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year, which was in 2% of the design target. Um, future phases and current energy strong homes are aiming um, for a lower value around 40 but in as you've seen from the kind of house types that we're working with it was quite a challenge in Nottingham because they're quite difficult um, form factors so the bungalows have a high surface area um, and the three-story houses have an undercroft and a stepped section um, and as I was alluding to yeah we're allowing for comfort taking in future energy modeling for our kind of current projects that we're working on um, the rollout has been progressing in Nottingham for six years following the first pilot project um, and due to the funding and leaving the EU, the project has been run as a series of projects um, and this has been, this has tested different approaches, um, particularly around uh, facade and roof construction and m &E. and what's positive from that is there's been this continuous learning and constant change of, you know, slight change of approach. Um, but the negative has been a lack of scale and purchasing power. For example, we haven't been able to replicate the kind of full PV roofs of the, the pilot because of not finding um, roofing, small, enough, small roofing contractors that could achieve that kind of integration of, of finishes. Um, overall, there have been modifications to reduce um, installation period and cost. Um, Installation by 60%, cost by around 45%. The works now take 12 days per property, um, but elapsed time, so over those days aren't necessarily consecutive and elapsed time will depend on, on sequencing. And it's also important that cost does 
that varies um, on quite a lot of factors per property. So it's the number of properties being retrofitted, the number of stories, the condition and the solution. Obviously, there's quite a difference between a three-story house and a bungalow or a flat that we have on this project. There have been some surprising lessons as well. So the second pilot, which is the image which you can see on the centre with the blue window surrounds, you'll see the thickness of the roof. So we trialled a thermally insulated roof cassette, also off-site manufactured. Um, however, when this was monitored, it showed that it performed um, no better than retrofitting the existing roofs. So the, the latest phases, um, make airtight and retrofit the existing roofs and then actually even reuse um, undamaged existing roof tiles around PV. So there's a, um, a focus on carbon, whole life carbon there as well. Um, some negatives that we've seen um, is a reduction in the quality of finishes to get down to the lower cost budget. So we've moved um, from um, powder coated aluminium to UPVC copings, flashings and rainwater goods. And also the window surrounds were in the original pilot were really crisp powder coated aluminium, but due to like the lead time and the cost per window, which could then be problematic if it came um, damaged, the uh, solution provider Amelia's Homes have moved to um, fiber cement surrounds. That's the same material as the cladding and they will get sprayed the different colours, um, so obviously not quite as good in terms of longevity. And I'm going to conclude with um, a series of observations on the project process. Um, so the first is the um, importance of laser scanning. So we have lots of drawings like this in the office. So every every terrace is um, the first starting point of the project is to survey every terrace and that external survey becomes for us the basis of the um, planning elevations but it also is the starting point for um, Melis's design drawings for the, um, the facade panels um, and it sets out where things like windows and rainwater goods need to go it's kind of important to realize although the houses are all on the surface look the same, they're 70 years old, everything has slumped, changed, moved over time. Um, so it's quite a lot of, and there's variation within the types as well. Um, this heading is, a uh, devil is in the window surround detail taken straight for an email. So this is an example of the kind of level of control the solution provider Emilius can have when they're building things in a factory. So this is an excerpt from the 11 page manual they have for how to insert a window in a panel and can see the kind of precision with which these panels are built in the, the small detail photograph to the left. Um, one lesson is around ventilation. So um, MVR has proven too expensive when you're making a whole life decision. Um, and instead um, we're installing demand controlled MEV um, which uses relative humidity sensitive air inlets um, and that's more compatible for retrofit because it's more compact, has less ducts, um, is quieter so it doesn't get turned off by residents and is controlled room by room so it doesn't put the whole house into boost and overall it's less expensive so it's not the right solution for everything but for these retrofit projects has been a good option. Um, and then just a few things that can be done before and after in terms of analysis, so before and after the retrofit. Um, the first is getting monitoring systems installed early to give before data, which can then be compared after the retrofit, um, especially about the effectiveness of ventilation systems. Um, and that allows us to confirm, compare the performance to the design intent of the building um, and also um, ideally to communicate to residents and help with issues as well. Um, resident satisfaction saying is, is really key and also really important to do before the retrofit. Um, residents are like the best sensor that we have um, in homes and we're seeing lots of issues with damp and mould for instance in existing homes before the retrofit so there are, there are quite a lot of reasons why um, this approach is so key and important to do. Um, and also there's part of the standard is overheating analysis as well um, which again is done pre and post retrofit what we're seeing um in nottingham i think what really stands out is that um 
the contractor, the retrofit contractor has to be a specialist at working in people's homes while they're occupied. This is a totally different way of working than um, even large contractors, specialist contractors would be used to um, and involves um, a large amount of liaison and kind of clearing, packing up, putting things back at the end of each day, for instance, and sequencing as well. Um, and I think that's where we're seeing the additional cost for retrofit particularly lies is in this interaction with residents. And if access can't be arranged, it's costly because it leads to um, changes to sequencing. So just to conclude with a couple of final thoughts. So the first one is that particularly the, the original pilot highlighted how unequipped the supply chain is for um, MMC, Modern Methods of Construction. It resulted in um, Melia's Homes have established an advanced MMC fa factory in Nottingham. Um, so it's using a, um, a building that the client owned. We helped um, design the layout of the factory. Um, and so it's in creating these closed panel timber frame panels which are very specific to the project and I think it's a real um, positive example of localism and there are huge benefits to setting up the factory to employment training and kind of subcontractor mental health as well it's an excellent story and then the other conclusion is what I'm really keen to stress about the approach is the opportunity to transform areas with desirable and comfy homes to strengthen communities and massively increase social value so it's a real kind of appeal for the role of design in this process and the fact that rather than so I think our Nottingham project is quite unique in trying to transform the appearance of homes and also um, change the whole neighborhood so probably haven't talked about it very much but there are examples of turning you know garages into new front doors enlivening streets so there's a real role for kind of characterful design and urban design as well and having architects involved in the process and I think could bring huge benefit to existing strong communities in areas. that's the end of the presentation Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, really interesting and very clearly laid out for us as an audience. So thank you for doing that. And thank you, Richard, for, for joining Suzanne for the Q&A. And um, just a reminder, there is the chat function, the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So have a think about what questions you might like to put to Richard and Suzanne, and I'll read those out and address them to them. Um, but just to get started, I was interested to know like the journey for Studio Partington really like how did you come across the Enneke Sprog model it's been developed in Netherlands did you know a lot about it before like just a little bit about the the background to you and the practice with the scheme yeah I don't know uh, who wants to talk <laughs> yeah, no, so it started um like uh, nearly 10 years ago when a major sort of facilities and housing management company Wilmot Dixon had a branch that dealt with energy services. And there were two really interesting characters there that got very interested in retrofit and energy spot. And they invited us to some workshops with some really great engineers and structural engineers to try and think through how you would overclad buildings from first principles. Mm. And um, we, we kind of started going to these workshops wondering a bit Okay, what we should be doing there because of the sort of you know the intellect in the room was quite astonishing and ended up just with big marker pens and big sheets of sugar paper drawing what people were thinking so the first set of drawings that we did uh were really drawings properly coordinated multidisciplinary drawings with engineer and services engineer drawing over a base drawing that we'd done yeah. and at the same time we were watching videos of uh how they were doing it in the Netherlands and lo looking at all the things that we can't do in the UK for various reasons. Like we've got, you know, hilly, hilly towns with step terraces and we've got to do you know, it, parts of a terrace and then a break in between. So we, we got interested in the technical side, really. And then we we formed, we were part of the formation of Melius as a new company. So people from Wilmot Dixon went out on their own in order to do energy sprung and we joined in with that on the technical and design side and we were interested in the potential for designing new homes with MMC but where every home could be unique because we worked out very early on that each panel had to be different so you had to find a way of manufacturing with that 
degree of flexibility and uh, adaptability. Right. Yeah, so it's, it's, mm. you know, just uh, fascinating. It was no, there was no commercial yeah. or uh, you know special intelligence. It was just, oh, who can who can hold a felt pen and draw? And so, <laughs> uh, no. well, obviously very skilled in doing that. But um, yeah, it's a nice collaborative starting point, and and then it kind of branched from there. So thank you for that. And we've got questions coming in from our attendees now, and um, so I'll address those to you. And maybe between you, you decide who's best to, to answer, Richard and Suzanne. And um, so this is from Stefan. Um, is Energy Sprong primarily suitable for institutionally owned homes, housing associations, council, etc.? Or are there precedents for using Energy Sprong in owner occupied housing, for example, a terrace with four to five different owners? I don't know who wants to take that one. <laughs> um, I, I think it's really suitable for some of the housing stock um, built, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century and then after the war with uh, offsite factory techniques that are now failing. So lots of the low fines, precast concrete systems, cross wall houses like Nottingham, because you basically not relying on the structure of the existing home. So part of the idea with Medius was that we would target homes that couldn't be mortgaged and bring them up to a standard where, you know, there was a there was a kind of investment that brought a capital benefit as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, eminently suitable for that kind of home. Um, in retrofit generally, we're struggling on Victorian terraces just because they're so hard to do and the planning constraints are so difficult as well. Mm. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, next question from Sarah. Um, how did you address the thermal bridging with the non-refurbished houses? Uh, okay, so this is this is. You need your felt uh, pen out again, Rich. <laughs> no, no, this is where the cost model is is mm. is really difficult because we had to spend more money on the interface with the leaseholder home than we would have spent if we just overclad their home. But because you can't use public money on a privately loaned dwelling, we had to basically return the thermal envelope along the party wall, insulate internally on the Nottingham City home side. So a very complicated and very fiddly sort of non-standard cost. And that those sort of abnormals are the thing that make the base cost that Suzanne was talking about very difficult to achieve because it, yeah. it's an absolute nightmare. Yeah. You have yeah. to accept performance isn't as good with the yes. mm. often you can't insulate and future projects you know we found you couldn't insulate internally because there just wasn't yeah. the space or the kitchens or bathrooms against that party wall so there has to be an acceptance that there are abnormal ones where you get ends or gaps both in cost and performance yeah, yeah. I suppose and, that's um, yeah nottingham tried really hard to persuade private landlords to join in as well okay. so um, so this is another difference from us and the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, if there's a terrace of houses, they have a kind of corporate control over what happens to the terrace. And you can't have one person opting out of a scheme that 10 want to join in with. So you're able to do all of the terraces in one go because the governance and the leaseholding structures are different. That's interesting to know. Yeah. And um, have you noticed with the development that there's been less of those problems, more owners are actually coming on board or is it hard for you to track and um... I think the rollout so it, ha it has stayed just as the um the social housing that's been done so we still have those right to buy gaps mm. but into and that there is in Nottingham it's different in different areas but in Nottingham tenants are actually allowed to opt in and out okay. as well which has caused some some sequencing issues although okay. I've heard uh, reports of like people being really you know wished they'd had it done um once they'd yeah. seen what happened so um it's, it's quite few and far between but it has happened and it has yeah. impacted the program and that's partly why you see it taking quite so long you know yeah. it's been a six-year process and it is really yeah. hard to do yeah. really if um if government pushed harder and made it really clear to private landlords that they need to get homes up to epc c or b if that was just publicly understood, then lots of those leaseholders would join in straight away because it's a really easy sort of, you know, very convenient leg up to getting to the standard they need. But unfortunately, yeah. because there's so much uh, ambiguity and so little direction around the upgrade of the, you know, rented stock, mm. there's not really the interest or the, or the incentive. Yeah. 
the motivation to do it. Well, yeah, thank you for explaining all that. Super interesting. Um, question from Oliver, but I think it's kind of been answered. He was talking about the panel system being suitable for other build types, such as the terraces. And as you've explained, Richard, it's it's quite tricky to uh, retrofit some of those. But do you want to add to that or say yeah, more? So the, the panel system is actually suitable for new build as well. So okay. We for housing development in Dermotthorpe in York. There are, I think it's two homes there that Melia's Homes constructed. So they look exactly the same as the rest of the estate, which is either built traditionally or using, um, it does use some MMC, so thin bed masonry and slips panels for the roofs. Um, but yeah, so there are some identical houses there that, that prove that this system um, can be used for new build as well. Right. Um, lots of the questions just continuing the story, really. So um, how much complexity do you think would have been either added or avoided should the project have also been able to include the privately owned homes? Um, uh, so the first drawing, when I do the talk about all the things we confronted when we started, the first drawing we did was just drawing the terrace as it was and then trying to imagine the walls and the roof being 350 mil wider. Mm -hmm. and then changing when you get to a leaseholder home and everything is difficult so you've got the return where you've got to close the end of the panel you've got gutters running at high level that have to step in and out you've got a roof that was drained perhaps by two neighbors that then needs to be drained independently you've got services running along at the base of the terrace that you're moving outwards mm -hmm. for all the retrofitted homes because you want all the drainage to be another meter away from the foundations but then you're stepping in or changing for the existing home so it's it's an absolute nightmare i mean it's you know if margaret thatcher was alive now and she could see her legacy she would realize how complicated right to buy has made you know yeah. this this whole challenge yeah um, the, yeah all the different variations of it yeah um and along those lines i suppose uh Patty, my colleague, is thanking you for the presentation. Um, she's curious to know what was the most unexpected challenge of the project. Um, like you've obviously talked about some of the challenges, but the most unexpected. Uh, it's it's leaving people. It's having people in their homes while you're doing the retrofit. So um, everybody was really enthusiastic about that, you know, because if you have to move out for five or six months and your kids maybe have to change school and you've got yeah. to, it's such an upheaval. Um, but we discovered things like the garage undercross that Suzanne mentioned. Actually, people had them as a bedroom, you know, so when we took the wall away and there was like furniture and bed and bedside table. Yeah. And then the problem of just coming back. So the panel comes complete, but you've obviously got to take the old window out and then make a junction for things like a window sill and a surround that's airtight with a new panel. It's just the coordination of doing all of those things around people's everyday lives is really, really difficult. And, and that's the single thing that I think Melius didn't account for. And it's Suzanne's comment about having expertise in managing those processes and managing and coordinating the times when things can happen and how you leave somebody's home and yeah. when you know who's going to be there what their role is every you know it needs a lot of explanation because people are often quite vulnerable and quite anxious about you know builders mm -hmm. tracing around um so it's, it's a difficult challenge i'd say Munis like didn't account for it they've actually got incredibly good at it so when mm. you go back it's really striking you know it's not set up or anything but how many residents are you know at home come out to tell you like even though there's still work going on how many years later they come out mm -hmm. telling you how great it's been and, and there have been lessons and improvements of what Richard was just talking about about the kind of internal window detail where you need to make good once you put the new facade with the windows already in it um, mm -hmm. Medius has um, prefabricated that so now okay. it's just like a single element that gets taken into people's homes so it can be done much quicker less yeah less disruption and yeah they've made progress with making it easier for residents as well Great. Oh, that's amazing. It's their lessons learned and kind of changes for, for the good coming. So that's great. OK, moving on. Um, question about oh, it's from Chris, who's Letchworth Garden City heritage linked person um, in Letchworth Garden City. Steps and buildings caused by extra insulation and difference in ownership is viewed poorly. Were there any planning issues that had to be overcome? And do you have any tips for putting forward an argument that the contrast creates architectural interest and a compliment for your presentation? 
thank you. So, um, so I think planning was like, it's a really good story here. So it's really strategic. There was um, real kind of like interest in the, the system and political will. And we were able to, um, in terms of kind of procedure and process, we kind of high level planning meetings. And then actually the individual applications for all this work were able to be done by leaseholder applications. Um, so, sorry. Yes, that's right. Isn't it? No, no, sorry. Well, Homeowner, it that's, that's the right word. Homeowner yeah. application. So very kind of limited paperwork once we'd set the overall strategy and kind of a design code and then you kind of see the bright colors as well so we had this idea that every terrace would have so originally the houses are all kind of same drab finishes um in poor condition and very similar you know walk across nottingham see the same houses across the whole city in totally different areas so there was this kind of proposal that started with the pilot of giving each terrace an identity through the kind of simple device of the coloured window surrounds and um, the starting point was to let the residents choose the um, colour so I think there were okay. a few raised eyebrows in the planning department when the first terrace was built kind of lipstick pink but I think when you when you visit Nottingham and you see all the the kind of diff they're not actually depending on the light and the angle you catch the buildings, it's not as colourful as you might imagine. And it really has uplifted the area. And um, yeah, I think it looks fantastic, both the light finish and then the kind of coloured contrast. Mm. We kind of transform the appearance and that's possibly something that we're not seeing in subsequent energy sprung schemes. So we're really trying to highlight, you know, that you can have this sort of urban design and overall mm. identity. Yeah. yeah, I think there is a real difficulty in retrofit, um, especially in a historic context. So if you're thinking about Letchworth, where some of the quality is in the kind of consistent approach to the way homes were made, the kind of craft tradition, some of the quality is in the landscape and the public realm. And it's sort of more obviously straightforward, uplifting an area that's very sort of run down and, and neglected, neglected I think in Nottingham's case, because homes were getting pretty much to the end of their planned life. And one of the things that I worry about is that the, the end result of a retrofit is a home that really doesn't look as good by any standards as the original home, being a real disincentive for people. So mm. when you see brick homes clad in very regular plastic bricks, you're thinking, you know, is this really an improvement? And, and I think that Letchworth, question is a really interesting one because you you would need to be able to find a solution that people can see as actually kind of visually and also in in you know ethically and and uh, in terms of the kind of spirit of the place consistent with what Letchworth's about having yeah. said that Letchworth was the you know one of the starting points for you know exhibition homes made in factories so it has a tradition of kind of tackling these things as well yeah, innovation or yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know it's interesting to think about the architect's role in delivery, but also the design and yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting. Um next question then. Um can you say a bit more about the support you receive from Energy Sprong, both at design stage and for the contractor upskilling trades? So I think the Energy Sprong see themselves it's like a helping hand kind of organization. So they are there and they support Kind of everyone involved in the process they offer support to like the landlord so the local authority um and they can be involved kind of at strategic stage helping like what we were just talking about what's most appropriate for energy sprung retrofit where are those homes that are most difficult to do basically both in terms of like the actual construction of the home um how poorly it's performing but also in terms of the residents and the most need um and then they can they also they support the um the solution providers so the contractors they're called solution providers because the innovation is that they um, guarantee the performance for up to 30 years um, so the support there from energy sprong so like doing the kind of occupant surveying helping with the monitoring helping explain the performance um, requirements because it's like a whole spreadsheet of it's not just about the kind of space heating um, there is a whole um, model there based on the kind of average consumption for residents or they can always use more um, and then they also support the to some extent support the residents themselves as well so once yeah. the kind of monitoring is in place they can answer questions yeah. lots of roles <laughs> yeah. yeah culturally though energy sprung is really miles away from 
the traditional route to improving the housing stock. And it, we found it's very helpful to have NEG Sprong's kind of expertise, but trying to explain to housing association and local authority asset managers that you need to think about these things in a rounded way. Think about comfort, think about ventilation, think about improving the home, think about improving the layout. It's so at odds with the kind of mentality, siloed mentality of we do kitchens on a five year, you know, renewal program and we replace roofs two years after somebody reports a leak and we'll do the windows every and and we haven't a hope if we carry on like that because the kitchens get replaced and the opportunity of improving the insulation behind the kitchen cabinets is lost, you know, or the windows get replaced and nobody's understanding how the window performance interacts with the ventilation. Mm -hmm. So energy sprung are brilliant at trying to get everybody to understand what's involved, but it, it's really frustrating, um, really, really frustrating trying to get the message across that you mm -hmm. can't do it in a piecemeal way if you want to mm -hmm. be successful with retrofit. It's a challenging thing as well. So if they're coming yes, in yeah. from a background, so we may be seeing a lot of larger contractors coming in from a kind of maintenance background, um, you know, where the remit might have been replacing kitchens and bathrooms on a kind of rolling program. Mm -hmm. To have that team try and understand what energy strong is and a kind of whole house deep retrofit, that is that's a big challenge as well that we've seen on some subsequent projects too. Great. No, thank you for explaining that. Um, really good to hear. Um, or not good to hear because we know there's a, a long way to go on the upskilling and the financing and lots of aspects of just how we work to deliver these retrofit projects. Um, so final question. Um, so question about funding. Like, Is there funding and grants available for private landlords? I assume through Energy Sprong, um, although that wasn't explicitly stated, but I assume that's the focus. <laughs> uh... Um, I must admit we're not we're not necessarily the best people to ask that question. But the last time I looked in the general retro, retrofit sort of sphere, it looked as if all of the money was being directed to housing associations and local authorities through the social housing decarbonation fund, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, or to um, private householders so not necessarily homeowners but private householders but people who had demonstrable need so uh, generally receiving benefits or some support of some kind so there's a sort of gap in the middle between the, the very needy and then the much larger organizations that are actually managing housing and I think that that looking back that sort of funding for private individuals disappeared about five five six years ago so yeah. after the demise of um you know the, the the green deal and initiatives like that we're, yeah. we're not we're not best placed to answer but that's that's my understanding where it is at the moment yeah no, that's that's a, a a good broad answer richard so i'm sure um people can look into things further through the retrofit program as well so um thank you both thank you suzanne and thank you richard and thank you everyone for attending today and um, just a few closing notes from me um as i mentioned it's our last retrofit talks our last webinar for the retrofit 23 program um so yeah, just appreciate everybody joining us. Um, this particular recording and um, this event has been recorded and we'll post it on our Building Centre YouTube channel and on our website as soon as possible. So you can watch back, share with friends, colleagues who maybe couldn't make it today. Um, do feel free to, to keep in touch with the Building Centre's Retrofit programme. We haven't finished, the webinars have finished, um, but we've still got our in-person panel events in the Building Centre on Wednesday evenings, if you can make those. So tomorrow night we have actually have an event on finance so the person who asked the finance question if you can make it do come along and um, that starts at six o'clock and can be booked via the eventbrite system and um, we've got other topics coming up looking at um, retrofit of scalable solutions district heating fire safety lots of topics that influence the retrofit um jigsaw puzzles so yeah look out for those on the buildingcenter.co.uk website um, and in terms of the webinars I just want to give a shout out to some colleagues so thank you to Patty D'Souza who's been alternating co-hosting these events with me and Michael James who's been doing all our technical setup and support and then our director John Bonning for 
basically promoting the retrofit topic and agenda here for the center um so yeah do keep in touch do watch back the recordings and share and um yeah the exhibitions on until the 12th of october now we've extended a little bit so come and see the energy sprong studio partington display panels in that um and yeah if you can share the information and um, do so as i say we're on till the 12th of october so a little bit longer to get involved right thank you everyone and thanks again to richard and suzanne bye bye, bye.